Greetings and salutations. Welcome, everybody, to another edition of 10 Things I Like here on the Severe MMA YouTube page. I am E. Spencer Kite, friendly neighborhood Spencer Man, back to look at UFC Vegas 68, as I said. A fight card that, listen, if there's going to be one early in this year where, where people want to say, really, man, you got 10 things you like about this card and kind of want to question it a little bit, fine. I, I will understand it here. This is a formerly international fight card that has been shifted to the UFC Apex due to some scheduling issues, some fighter availability issues, moved from Seoul, South Korea, still has a very Asian market, Pacific Rim market flair to it. The finals of the road to UFC tournaments are here. A bunch of stuff that if you weren't paying attention to those tournaments as they took place, quarterfinal round in June, semifinal round in October, then I fully understand why this is a fight card for you that feels very foreign, truthfully, in terms of the names on this card and maybe one that you're you're not into. It also has a later start time than normal. The prelims start for me out here on the West Coast of Canada at 7 p.m. The main card starts at 10 p.m., um, which is just... It's, it's one of those things. I understand why it's happening. It's going to turn some people off. And so it's also for people watching in Canada that are happening to catch this, this broadcast. This is one of those events as, as Aaron Bronstetter of TSN and, and previous guest of on a conversation with tweeted out earlier this week. This is going to be one of those fight cards that airs exclusively on fight paths. So it's got a lot of things working against it. But for me, it also has a lot of things working for it. And we're going to get through them. We're going to start with number one, a critical heavyweight placement fight. So I said yesterday that I like this main event between Derek Lewis and Sergey Spivak because it's going to answer my question of where do each of these guys stand at this moment in what I feel is a shifting sort of fluid heavyweight division. Derek Lewis is coming off some losses. He's one in three in his last four. Is he still a guy that you have to get through in order to get into that upper tier. And we're just learning that that upper tier is a little bit deeper than it was previous to, you know, than in, than in previous years when Derek Lewis was sort of in that five, five to six range where he's now more in the seven to eight range. We're also going to find out if Sergey Spivak is a guy that can beat someone of Derek Lewis's experience and caliber and power. He's done very well over his last few fights. He's won two straight. Five of his last six, the losses to Tom Aspinall. He's playing to his strengths. He's doing things well. But is it good enough? Is he ready to take that next step in his late 20s and ascend into really the top sort of seven, eight in the heavyweight division? I love fights like this. I understand from the perspective that Sean often talks about and that we will probably talk about on the, on the preview show when we sit down myself, Ian and Harry and tape that that it doesn't really move anybody, nothing really big changes in the division based on this result. These two, whoever wins will be at, you know, the, the higher ranking of these two men and whoever loses, they'll just basically flip-flop if that's the case. If Spivak wins, he and Lewis will flip-flop. If not, they'll remain where they are. Nothing changes in that regard. But it changes how we look at each of these athletes going forward. If Derek Lewis loses again, then his days as the guy that you have to beat to get into the upper echelon are probably done. We'll have to start talking about, okay, Derek Lewis is one in four in his last five fights. Is it maybe the time that, that this is coming to an end or is there still room for him to be an effective member of this division? If Sergey Spivak wins, we have to start asking, is this a guy that we need to be paying real close attention to? Not just, you know, me having my personal interest and infatuation with him that Sean and I argued about last year on a preview show where I talked about him being 27, 28 years old and only being a couple of years in to working with the crew at Extreme Couture and getting better and improving and developing and giving him that time to grow. If he goes out and beats Derek Lewis on Saturday, clearly all of those things have, have taken root and had an impact and we get to see whether there's room for more growth. And we just keep paying attention to see how much further this goes. I like fights like this. These are interesting fights. Now you can make an argument and I'm, I'm here for it 
that these kinds of fights shouldn't be main events. And you're, you're really trying to wring out the last of the name recognition and viability as a headliner of Derek Lewis in this, in this situation. And so I'm, I'm here for that. I understand that, but as a fight, as a fight, that's going to help me figure out what the top 10 of the heavyweight division looks at looks like as we draw closer to the heavyweight title fight and further figuring some of this stuff out, it's important. And I want to see what happens. Item number two, speaking of important heavyweight clashes, we get another one. Marchant Tybura and Blagoy Ivanov. Again, anything that's going to help me get a better understanding of how a division lines up so that I can start projecting different matchups, so I can start figuring out who some of the younger emerging talent or up and coming talent in a given division is going to face are always of interest to me. And so I look at a guy like Tybura, I spoke about it yesterday on one question, as the heavyweight Neil Magny, guy that's just perfect where he is in sort of that 10 through 12 range in the heavyweight rankings, durable, experienced, solid everywhere, but not spectacular anywhere, not going to go on a late career run to be a title contender, but just perfect where he is. Ivanov is somebody that has had an up and down career in the UFC. He's three and three. It's been hit or miss. There hasn't been any real consistency in terms of his efforts, but he's a tough out. He's a guy that you're not going in there and running through. You don't look good against Blagoy Ivanov. And so this fight, if Tybura can look good against him, it affirms those things that I talked about yesterday that I'm thinking about him as this sort of veteran stalwart in the Neil Magny sense of things in the division. And if Ivanov can get a win, then he can take that position and sort of hold down that role and become sort of the one, the one B to Tybura's one a, because it's never a bad thing to have more than one of these guys. And I know that that doesn't make sense to some people. I know that's not appealing to some people and I get that. And that's fine. I understand. But for me, as somebody that looks at this, from more than just a who's in the title picture and everybody else isn't so screw them and thinks about it in a year down the road, two years down the road, five years down the road kind of sense many times, as well as just in the here and now, these kinds of guys are important. They carry value. They have influence in divisions. They are needed to make these ec ecosystems continue to work. And so I'm always interested to see them compete. Tybura looked great in stopping Alexander Romanov's unbeaten streak last time out. Let's see what he can do this weekend. Item number three, the return of Duho Choi. As my guy JHK called him today, the Korean Superman, no longer a super boy at age 31. We'll see if he changes that or if he just continues to go the Stephen Wonder Boy Thompson route, even though Wonder Boy is... Closing in on 40. Welcome to the club, Stephen. We're happy to have you. I talked yesterday when it came to Duho Choi, when it came to his fight on Saturday against Kyle Nelson about sort of what's happened to him, his results in his last three fights being sort of the byproduct of that, that war with Cub Swanson, that battle with Cub Swanson. And it's hard. It's difficult. I'm still excited to see him fight though. And this is the, this is the dilemma that we face. Harry and I talk about it regularly on the takeaways, right? I'm, I'm nervous that he's never going to be the same fighter that he was, that the punishment that he took in that fight and subsequent fights, subsequent losses to Jeremy Stevens and Charles Rodin have just changed him irreparably. But I'm also excited to see him back out there after you know, more than two years away, more than three years away, excuse me. Last fight was at the end of 2019. And so I'm a little conflicted. The fan in me, the, the, the person that likes exciting fights, the spectator that wants to see action fighters like Duho Choi is very excited to see him return. The guy that's thinking about this from a bigger picture standpoint about his health about his well-being going forward is a little bit nervous. It's a tough thing to balance. And it's a thing 
that I wrestle with more and more as I continue to get older, as I continue to see athletes that I've watched their entire UFC runs get into later stages of those, those careers and struggle or guys that I've followed throughout their primes, get into their post prime stretch of things and it just not be the same. And you see some of that accumulation and the struggles that have come from, from the battles inside the octagon. It's tough, but I'm excited to see him compete at his best in those early days. And, and even through that fight with Cub Swanson, the fight with Stevens was competitive until it ended. The fight with Charles Jordan was, was fun. Like Duho Choi has been a bankable all action fighter throughout his six fight UFC run. And I want to see that. I I'm excited to see that. And I hope we get that version. I hope we can have a little throwback to those early, those first three fights, the successful fights, even like I don't need another hall of fame caliber fight. Like the one he had with Cub Swanson. And I don't think we're going to get that out of, out of Kyle Nelson on Saturday. I'd like to see a return to form a little bit for Duho Choi to just kind of maybe put some of those concerns at ease, even just temporarily. Item number four, good initial test for Yusaku Kanishita. So came off the contender series with a win over Jose Enrique, who is gigantic tall, very green, didn't know how to use all of the, the length advantages that he had. And Kinoshita fought exceptionally well. Used that range to his advantage, truthfully. Worked his way inside, landed, got out of the way. Moved around really well, was able to cut some angles, was able to do a lot of very good things. He won that fight handily despite getting a little cut on the side of his head that gave him side of, sort of a, a side of the head Davison Figueredo god of war streak. Now he gets Adam Fugit, which is a step up in competition from a experience standpoint, right? Adam Fugit has done well on the regional circuit, held his own for a couple rounds against Michael Morales in his promotional debut last year. This is a good test. These are the kinds of fights I want to see out of the gate, especially for a 22 year old fighter coming off the contender series with limited experience. I believe this will be his eighth fight overall as a pro. And so it's great that it's not thrown in there with a 20, 25 fight veteran. Adam Fugit has 12 fights. So there's more experience. He's fought some good competition. So there's that edge to lean on. He's an older gentleman compared to Kinoshita by 12 years. Good test. Let's see it. I've talked throughout the last couple of years about being unsure of these athletes coming off the contender series and wanting to see these initial performances to make a little bit more of an assessment. Kinoshita looked good in his win and I liked him that night, that afternoon, that evening, watching the fight back at, I think it was the end of August. But let's just see, now that we're here, now that you're on the roster, now that you're going forward, Let's just see. Let's get through this one, make a read, make an assessment, get a little bit more data to, to look at and figure out where this guy can potentially go in a division that, you know, welterweight can always use. Every division can always use early 20s promising talent. So let's just see. Item number five, Jekka Sadagi is fighting. Listen, if you didn't watch the Road to UFC tournaments, this one means nothing to you because you've never heard of Jekka Saragi, Indonesian fighter in the finals of the uh, lightweight competition against Anshul Jubli. But let me tell you, my guy is a bundle of energy. He is a, a pack of excitement. And I cannot wait to see him make the walk to the octagon on Saturday. He loves every minute of this the way you would expect somebody or you would hope everybody for the duration of their career could remain in love with this. He's smiling and bouncing and dancing and moving and playing on the way out to the octagon. He's got little movements that he does and little signature things that he does when he's getting introduced. He's got some flair when he's getting his hand raised and in between intro and decision, dude is on fire. He's out there trying to put you away 
and willing to do it in spectacular fashion. His win in the quarterfinals over Pawan Man was a spinning backfist that was just a beautiful spinning backfist, like timed out, read out properly, perfectly. Landed it, clean, walk off, we're done. His KO in the semifinal round was a beautiful retreating, sort of intercepting right hand. My man was coming forward on him and he just cocked one back and hit him clean and we were done. I want to see this dude. I have a piece coming up on Friday, or sorry, on Thursday, today, on OSDB Sports, talking about representation, which I touched on yesterday in one question. And, and Sergi is a big part of that. He's the first Indonesian fighter to grace the octagon. Those things matter. This is a huge moment for him, for his country, for his people, for the sport in that area. And so I want to see it because I think it's going to be kind of special. And, and listen, just give me special moments. Give me things that make me happy. Give me things that make me smile. Jekka Sergi makes me smile. Item number six. Jung Young Lee looks to keep rolling. My guy has gotten two sub 45 second knockouts to work his way into the finals of the featherweight competition on the road to UFC. It has been just heaters, just rockets. And look, again, there are going to be people that want to say, ah, I don't know who this guy is and quality of this fight card and yada, yada, yada. But we're also the, the community that goes bonkers retweeting brutal knockouts every single day when we see them from all over God's green acres. And so are you bound to, they have to be names that I know in the UFC, or do you just want to see good fights and entertaining action? Cause he's going to bring it. The Korean tiger is an entertaining fighter. He's got his last three wins are all first round stoppages in less than 45 seconds. Now that's hard to maintain. Granted, may not get there. But just the fact that he has that potential, just the fact that he's got that on the resume right now and got to the finals facing solid competition by starching fellas in 45 seconds or less piques my interest. Let me see it. Let me keep watching it. It was my question yesterday. Can he keep doing this? One of the reasons I'm interested in tuning in on Saturday is to see if he can keep doing this. This is the stuff that draws me in. I think there are times where we get way too bogged down in wanting to cling to the narratives and the stories and the name value and all of that stuff when it comes to, and almost exclusively when it comes to the UFC. They're the only ones we judge by this. Everything else, we just want to see fun fights. We just want to see action. UFC, it has to be so much more than that. Set that aside on Saturday. Settle in, watch some of these hungry, energetic, emerging, talented fighters get in there and try to make their dreams come true. Thank me later. Item number seven. All Japanese bantamweight tournament fighter. Toshiomi Kazama versus Rinya Nakamura, who has been my pick as the most impressive fighter throughout this competition thus far. If you like grappling, this should be a grappling delight. Kazama wanted to be a professional grappler before deciding maybe I'll do that as well as pursue a career in the UFC or per pursue a career in MMA that has put him now on the cusp of, of taking that to the UFC. He upset one of the early tournament favorites, uh, my, my T in the opening round and looked good, really relied on that grappling, had some nice sweeps, had some nice takedowns, really good grappler. Rinya Nakamura is a former world champion under 23 freestyle wrestler. And he's looked the part thus far. His key lock submission win was great. He got a stoppage win on the feet in the quarterfinals. He has looked the part of a guy that can come in. And I'm not saying instantly be a factor in the division in that he's automatically going to be a top 15 fighter and put him in there with somebody in that group right now. We're not there. But can he come in and, and hang in the middle of the pack? 
even in a talent rich division, like 35, I think so. I think he wins on Saturday, but I think it's going to be fun. I think it's going to be entertaining. We may end up getting a fight that cancels each other out. Neither guy needs to go to the ground or wants to go to the ground. And we end up seeing who's striking is better, which is an important thing to learn and make an assessment of, of fighters at this point, very early in their careers. But I mean, again, I get that you weren't watching Road to UFC. These two have been impressive. This is the deserving finals. It's a it's a really compelling fight to me. And I hope you turn it, tune in because I think one or both of these guys are going to be able to have lasting careers in the UFC. Item number eight, the all-Korean, sorry, all-South Korean flyweight tournament finale. Sungguk Choi versus Hyung Sung Park. It's been, as I said yesterday, on, on one question. My question was, which of these styles, which of these sort of ways of, of competing or methods of results, really, is going to win out? Choi has gone the distance in each of his tournament fights. Park has finished in the first round in each of his tournament fights. This is another one of those instances where I think both fighters can be long-term parts of the UFC roster. Flyweight can always use more people. So there's, there's that part of it just in and of itself. But they're talented enough to be on the UFC roster. They've proven that by getting to this point. I would not at all be surprised if all eight competitors in these tournament finales, there's four tournament finales on Saturday. I would not be surprised if all eight or at least six of them become long-term Get three, four, five, eight, ten 10 fights in the UFC. Get those opportunities to really grow in the octagon. And now I know there are going to be the cynics that say, of course, because the UFC can pay them nothing like they do with the contender series and all. Fine. If that's the approach you want to take to it, if that's the viewpoint you want to have about it, you're entitled to it. It's yours. Go right ahead. But as the guy that's compiling some data on the contender series, and looks at the number of graduates and where some of those graduates have gotten to. The fact that we just crowned the first ever Contender Series grad to win a title in Jamal Hill. We have Sean O'Malley as a number one contender at Bantamweight. We have standouts like Ryan Spann and Jeff Neal and various others. We've had Alex Perez fight for a title at Flyweight several years ago now. Those things are working. And whether you like them or not, they're successful. And yes, I, again, as always, I want people to get paid more money. No argument, but the contender series is doing its job and it's producing quality talent. Now it's produced some, some people that haven't gotten there, but the trade-off is you find the Jamal Hills and this tournament as well road to UFC has done what it was intended to do of unearth some talent from regions that have been thus far sort of underserviced in the last number of years, or in the case of Jekka Sadegi and Angel Jubilee, very, very limited representation in the UFC to date. No fighters from Indonesia, only one fighter previously from India, Barat Kandari, Arjun Buller, obviously an, an Indo-Canadian, but a Canadian and so I'm just excited to see these people get the opportunity to shine on a bigger stage and, and perform in front of more people than just the hardest of hardcores like me that were getting up and watching these fights. There's talent here. We keep wanting the UFC to unearth more talent and bring in more talented fighters. This is them attempting to do it. Please give them your time. Please give them an opportunity. Don't just judge them because of the way they got to the UFC or by your disdain for the UFC as a whole. Give the athletes the opportunity. Item nine, the return of Tatsuro Taira. He is one of my top 10 prospects in the UFC right now. 23 year old flyweight, absolute stud of a prospect. Takes on newcomer Jesus Aguilar. I think it's a good fight just from the perspective, as I said yesterday, of he now comes in with all the weight of the world on his shoulders. All the pressure is firmly 
on Tatsuyo Ta- Tatsuro Taira in this fight. Last time I checked, he was minus 1,200 as a favorite, which is a massive, massive favorite. He is expected to finish. He is expected to handle this thing rather quickly. That's an interesting position to be in at 23 and 12 fights into your career going into your third UFC appearance. That's a lot to wrestle with. It just is. And maybe he handles it with a plum and just slides through and gets that finish and wins in the first round and looks even more the part than he has thus far. But I want to see him do it. I want to watch to make a read of it happening and see how he navigates facing a guy that's a little bit older than him, has about the same experience, not necessarily the level of competition, is a specialist in terms of his guillotine choke, and is going to be able to counter some of the stuff that Tyra likes to do, or in theory, on paper, should be able to counter some of the stuff that Tyra likes to do in terms of the grappling and the submission game himself. I think Tyra is levels above Jesus Aguilar, And should get the victory, absolutely, on Saturday. But I still want to see it. I need to see these these tests, these performances, these challenges. Face these little wrinkles. Deal with these little hurdles. So that I get more download of of who you are and what you are in these positions. Because it only gets harder the further along you go. And I think he's going to go far. So pass some of these tests now. And let's see where we get to. Last but not least, number 10, Laura Sanko's fight night debut. I'm going to adjust myself in my chair for this one because this one is, is a little personal. This one means a lot to me. So when Laura Sanko started on Dana White's Contender Series, she was the announcer and she was the, the backstage interviewer speaking with the winners of the fights and then the people that got awarded contracts. And we spoke during that first season or just after the first season going into the second season maybe about her transition to being forward-facing and being on camera and having these opportunities. She had done some of it with Invicta, done well there, but knew even then that she wanted to call fights. Knew she wanted to be viewed and given the opportunity to work as an analyst and as a color commentary voice rather than just rather than a backstage interviewer. And I apologize for saying just because I do not mean to diminish that role. It is a difficult, difficult role. Fast forward to last year or two years ago now, Laura Sanko gets the opportunity, just kind of dropped in her lap of, hey, you're going to be on the call for Contender Series. And we spoke again. And she was pumped and she was still pretty excited. And and this moment that is happening on Saturday became the thing that she was focused in on. I want to call the fight night card. There's another one. We, we spoke last year for OSDB sports. There's another one that we won't talk about yet. I'll wait for, for Laura to give me the okay for us to bring that one up, but it's the next step. I think you can figure out what it is, but to see her get this opportunity and to see a woman be on, on comms on Saturday. Only the second female ever, Kathy Long, called the action at UFC 1, the first female in the UFC's modern era. This is a big thing. I spoke earlier about representation. This is part of it as well. And it's a big thing. And it's been great to see the support and the acknowledgement of this being overdue both for Laura and for having a woman on comms at some point has been great. But I don't want at any point for that to stop. I don't want there to be like, well, we got it and now it's a novelty. It's not a novelty. She's, she's amazing. She's excellent at what she does. She will fit right in there. The other part of this is she called the road to UFC with John Gooden. They did the first two rounds of this. She was excellent. They were great as a team. I wish John was calling this event on Saturday. Maybe he is. I haven't, I've reached out to him. I haven't heard back as to whether he is calling it. It would be a great, great idea for the UFC if if John was on the call because they already have that rapport and familiarity 
with the eight competitors in the tournament finale, in the tournament finals, I should say, as well as being able to understand who the rest of these athletes are. But for Laura, this is, I know what this means to her. We've talked about it for a number of years. We've stayed in touch the whole way along. And so I'm really happy for my friend. I'm really excited for my colleague and somebody that I know has been working towards this for a long time. So that's the, that's the last of the 10 things is that on Saturday night, when we launch into UFC fight night, Vegas, 868, Derek Lewis versus Sergey Spivak, whoever is leading the booth, whoever is on play by play, will cut to them standing next to the octagon. And one of the names they will say as joining them on the call is the first female to do it in 30 years, Laura Sanko. Tune in for it. Listen to it. Support her. Support these athletes that deserve, that deserve the support, that deserve a chance. Give them an opportunity. They will not disappoint you. You will come and thank me later. I know it's cliche now to do the like, this feels like one of those cards, but it feels like one of those cards. It feels like one of those events where all kinds of people are going to be out and come Saturday morning, sorry, Sunday morning, Monday morning, we're going to be talking about, God, that was a, that was a wild event. All these finishes, all these cool performances. DVR it. Watch it Sunday morning. Give them a chance. Give them a chance. I don't think you'll be disappointed. I hope you weren't disappointed with the show. That's it for today. Ian and I will be back tomorrow with the severe picks and plays. Looking to get things rolling again on the betting front. Keep improving on the prediction front and start, start really turning in some, some positive results, some big positive results this year in terms of breaking down and, and predicting and, and picking the action inside the octagon. Until then, I am E. Spencer Kite, your friendly neighborhood Spencer man. Thank you for watching. Thank you for subscribing. Check out all the boys on Twitter from Severe MMA. Follow them on Patreon, severemma.com forward slash pints. It is February 1 when I am taping this, February 2 when you are listening. Best time of the month to sign up right now. You get a full month's worth, five bucks, well worth the price of admission. Do it. Thank me later. Watch these fights. Thank me later. Know that I love you. Know that I appreciate you. Take care of yourselves. Take care of one another. We'll see you tomorrow.